Welcome to what's happening in Augusta for our third show. It's, uh, I guess the best way to describe it right now is, is that it's starting to get very hectic. Uh, there are still many bills to be heard and a lot of committees are still far behind. But I will say that several of my bills have been heard in committees and uh, last uh, show I talked about a bill that was uh, that I had presented on regulating the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, or PMP as they call it, uh, that I talked about on, last, on the last show, which was to make all providers that prescribe opiates use this computer program to prevent doctor shopping for persons that are basically addicted to opiates, that, are, uh, that become addicted to their medication, that type of thing. Uh, I have to say that that bill was totally shot down in committee. And what happened was is that we had a tremendous amount, I shouldn't say, a, a good number of providers and people representing the providers testify that it would be tremendously time consuming and they just didn't have the time to do it on an everyday basis to enter this. So it was, well, we can, we, we put it up on when they first prescribe it and then maybe look at it every six months. That was the, uh, the, the aspect of what they said. And uh, also that they were very good judges of character so they could tell if somebody was addicted or not. And uh, unfortunately, what I've got to say is, is that uh, Maine has one of the highest prescription drug addiction problems in the country in a percentage basis. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, I have to disagree with them, but unfortunately the bill got shot down that mandated that they track their uh, prescriptions because, in the, and the pharmacists do do this anyway. But anyway, uh, we will still continue pushing forward on this. Uh, one of the things uh, in my committee, Insurance and Financial Services, that we heard this week was actually a bill that uh, there is some new opiate drugs that are coming to the marketplace. And these opiate drugs are what they call abuse deterrent opiate analgesic drug products. Uh, what, they, what they want to do is they're bringing these products up to and trying to set it up so that these products are placed on the tier one with the formulary preferred drug list so that they're affordable to people. And I talked with a gentleman from Pfizer Drug Company, and from what he told me, I think this could be a big help pushing us in the right direction. Basically, the opiate drugs, a lot of times what they're doing now is they crush them and then they snort them. These drugs that they've come out with cannot be uh, crushed. And number two is when they take these drugs, they are on a very slow time release not on a quick time release, so therefore they could eliminate that push of that uh, dependency on them too. So it sounded pretty good. Uh, we were going to have, we'll have a work session on that and put it through. Of course, there's a few of the uh, uh, insurance companies aren't real crazy because it, they were trying to bring it down to a price range that people can afford and not up into uh, higher tiers that are going to be unaffordable type of thing. So that's coming forth and we will continue moving forward on that. The other, one of the other bills that I talked about was my film bill and that was actually heard in taxation last week. Uh, it was presented and it re I think it was well received by the committee. However, it was tabled for a short period of time because there is another bill that was put in that is similar to my bill that was put in by Representative uh, Scott Heyman and there's, the bills are similar, so what the committee thought was let's put this bill and then bring the other bill in and then we can look to combine them and possibly get a decent, uh, you know, a decent push out of it because it, it's going to mean a lot of jobs. And that is the big, uh, the big thing, a lot of jobs, a 20 plus million dollar film studio and films coming into Maine. So hopefully that will go in the right direction. <clears throat> we'll see what happens. Now, the other one, the, there's another bill that will be heard next week, and it's at my, that's my bill on domestic violence and abuse, that where I would like to uh, bring the, uh, the bail up to a cash bail of $4,000 if somebody gets arrested for, electric, for, for abuse uh, 
violence and abuse in, on a domestic basis. And what that would do, and then also if somebody can make bail, to use, uh, if available, there are three counties right now it's being tested in, is the electronic device that goes around your ankle so that you can be tracked. Now, uh, they would set up a parameter so you can't go within so many, whether it's a half a mile or a mile of the victim's house, the person you abused. And then if you do that, an alarm goes off at the police station and a police car is automatically dispersed to your house. Uh, looking at past incidences, I can see where that may have saved a few people's lives that were uh, taken over the past few years. Now, there is going to be opposition to that bill. And, and it's crazy, but to me, the, the opposition will be coming from a domestic abuse organizations. And they're saying that the bail is too high and only poor people couldn't afford to bail. Only rich people will be able to bail themselves out. And the jails are overcrowded. Uh, I'm starting to hear all of this stuff, so I know what's coming. And I just look at it from a standpoint, of course, the rich people can make the bail. That's why we have the electronics device. And you know what? If we can save one life a year with it, it's worth it. Uh, I'm sorry. It's just the way I feel. On another note, Senator Amy Volk uh, of Scarborough wants to ask Maine voters uh, to increase the length of the Senate term from two years to four years. Now, looking at it, yeah, it's nice to have that every two years vote, but then again, that might not be that bad of an idea. If we look at it from the standpoint that a big portion of our senators represent very, very large areas. I'll use Senator Whittemore, who was our senator uh, four years ago. I'll use his, his as an example. He lives in Skowhegan. His district goes from Skowhegan, Pittsfield, all the way up to the Canadian border. Tremendous amount of territory to cover and to stay in touch with constituents and things like that. And if we look at it from a standpoint of saying, okay, every two years, the first year is fine, but that second year becomes, I'll be, he's got to, if he wants to run again, he's got to start running for re-election and a couple of months is just not enough time to cover that area. So they really got to start running for re-election practically uh, halfway through the, the uh, session in that second year. We could get a lot of more work done, I think. Not only that, but some, a lot of the new senators, it takes them a, a while to learn the ropes. And that third year would be a big plus that they would know what's going on instead of you know finding their way through the first year and then having to run for re-election again by the second year. So that might not be a bad idea, but uh, she wants to bring it to the people, so we'll just have to take a look at it and let the people decide. <laughs> All right, now, one of the other things I want to take a look at today is the Maine Development Foundation's Measures of Growth for 2015. Now, they awarded the state of Maine four gold stars on looking at it. The gold stars were awarded in areas demonstrating exceptional performance. They are the cost of doing business, the cost of energy, air quality, and water quality. They noted that doing business, the cost of doing business in Maine is the lowest that it has been since 1990, which is really kind of phenomenal. The decline of electricity cost has eased the burden on Maine people and businesses. And Maine's water quality remains well above U.S. averages, and our air quality continues to improve. So those are very good things. However, on the other side, they uh, awarded Maine five red flags. <laughs> Well, one was for the wellness and prevention, uh, uh, one on spending on research and, de and development, one on high-speed internet subscribers, and one on transportation infrastructure, and the last but not least, fourth grade reading scores. Now also, here is a quick update on what is happening on welfare fraud and what is happening on the new fraud hotline. Mainers made 1,345 calls to the new fraud hotline in 2014. The Fraud Investigation Unit received 4,022 tips from all sources in 2014, including the fraud hotline, web reporting form, DHHS and other state employees, law enforcement, 
the Governor's Constituent Services Office, and from investigators from the National Public Assistance Reporting Information Systems, called Paris, obviously. <laughs> of the cases referred to the Attorney General so far this year, there were 25 potential counts of theft by deception, 16 of forgery, 13 of unsworn falsification, 12 of misuse of public benefits, and one of trafficking in public benefits. Some examples of welfare fraud right now include lying about income or dependent status in order to receive benefits, trading electronic benefit transfers, EBT cards, uh, for cash or drugs, and Recently, the DHHS Fraud Unit has recently trained dozens of law enforcement officers in combating welfare misuse laws, simplified reporting procedures between law enforcement and DHHS. The Welfare Fraud Hotline, by the way, if you want to get a pencil and paper, can be reached at 866-348-1129. Now, Getting on to a little bit more, there's another one, another bill that's being heard right now, which is, uh, I'm sure that everybody has seen a little bit of it in the press about, and that is about increasing the minimum wage. <clears throat> the Department of Labor had Julie uh, Rabin, Rabin, Rabinowitz, I'm sorry, <laughs> testified against the bill. All right, the department is opposed to those bills, uh, she noted during the hearing. Raising the minimum wage addresses the symptom and not the cause of poverty. The true cause of poverty, Rabinowitz argued, is a shortage of skilled workers, many of whom are young and need low-paying jobs to enter the workforce, which will help them build up skills and experience. Rabinowitz warned that wage increases will limit opportunities, making it less likely these workers will build up their skills through a job. Most skilled workers will be the first to be cut, she continued. The majority of people earning the minimum wage also are under 24 years old. Rabinowitz argued that the best way to help workers is through skill training programs rather than a higher minimum wage that could compel employers to either hire less or just automate some of their services through computers. Now, what I did was, nonetheless, Americans for the most part right now, overwhelmingly support raising the minimum wage. There was a uh, Gallup poll taken and upwards of 76% of the people favored raising it to $9 an hour, while 22% opposed the idea. And the studies on the subjects have shown varying results. Now according to a recent study of the National Bureau of Elect Economic Research, employment for low skilled workers fails as a minimum wage goes up. The study titled The Minimum Wage and Great Recession found that 40% federal minimum wage increases between 2007 and 2009 reduced employment and income growth for low-skilled workers and young workers relative to those workers in states where the new wage had less an effect. However, a report from the Center of Economic and Policy Research found that an increase of the minimum wage does not have much impact on employment. <clears throat> Two recent meta-studies analyzing the research conducted since the early 1990s concludes that the minimum wage has little or no discernible effect in employment prospects of low-wage workers. The report found that most likely reason for this outcome is, is that the cost shock of the minimum wage is small relative to most firms' overall costs and only modest relative to the wages paid to low-wage workers. You know, that's, and, and I can understand that somewhat, but you, I guess you need to take a, a close look at both studies, see who they call, what they used, and what type of industry, et cetera, because uh, I have seen it. And again, it doesn't, <clears throat> if minimum wage goes from 750 to 850 or something like that, yeah, maybe there's not that big of a uh, push, but if it jumped to 12 or $15 an hour, I think it would make a major, major difference. That's just my opinion. On another note, in case you missed it, Maine's most infamous businessman, Austin Jack DeCoster, and his son were sentenced Monday to three months in jail for their role in a 2010 salmonella 
outbreak that sickened thousands of people nationwide. So I just thought that that might be a, a point. Now, <clears throat> this past week, there were, I'll go over this, the bill situation because there's been a lot of that in the press. All right, there were four bills that became law this past week without the governor's signature, meaning that he neither was for nor against and just let the bills became law without his signature. There were 11 bills that he signed into law also, and there were two resolves, one he signed into law, the other one he just let go uh, to go in and did not veto him. Also, there were 37 new bills printed out and will be come to the floor of the House and will be assigned to committees. And in case you missed it, the governor put a new website up this week highlighting the Tax Me Less calendar. The new website highlighting this is, I'll give you the, uh, the website itself, so just get a pencil and paper out. It is http colon two forward slashes www.main.gov forward slash governor forward slash LePage forward slash tax calculator forward slash index.html. And that, what that does is you can look on it, uh, it'll give you your uh, wage level or whatever and what uh, the new taxes would, uh, how, how you will be affected by, by this. And it uh, gives you a lot of different information. Now, there is, uh, what I would like to do right now is, this is for, I know that uh, it's going to be passed on a lot of times that this show is aired, but this is for Labor Day, Monday, and the show will come on. I'm not Labor Day, I'm all right, Patriot's Day. <clears throat> Mine's not working this morning. But anyway, Monday night, this Monday night, Patriot's Day, at 6 p.m., there will be a school board budget meeting at the junior high and everybody is encouraged to attend. What I wanted to go over quickly before we end the show is, is that we've got a, there's a couple of things here which is a general purpose aid to local schools and paying for education in Maine. And I think these are important things that uh, you really need to take a look at too also in, when we're looking at the budgets and that type of thing, all right? The, the general purpose, I'm going to put my glasses on because it's a little bit smaller print. <laughs> the general purpose aid to local schools that we refer to, the funding that goes out to the state, to local schools district as GPA. So whenever you see GPA, you know what they're talking about. There are two separate columns and categories. There is a subsidy, which is $888 million in 2016 that's proposed. And that subsidy is schools may spend this money however they choose. The state has no authority to restrict or direct this money to or from any particular category. It is paid to the districts in monthly checks. Then you have the second column, which is miscellaneous costs. That is proposed at $76 million in 2016. This money also goes out to schools, but is targeted towards specific needs on programs. These include Baxter School for the Deaf, Maine School of Science and Math, early college programs, dropout prevention programs, aid to struggling schools, etc. The constitutional obligation, which is Article 1, Part 1, Section 1, Maine Constitution, the legislature shall require towns to support public schools, duty of legislature, a general diffusion of the adages of education being essential to the preservation of the rights and liberties of the people to promote this important object, the legislature are authorized and it shall be their duty to require the several towns to make suitable provision at their own expense for the support and maintenance of public schools. Now let's take a look at our EPS formula, paying for education. Calculates the cost of the essential programs and services to educate Maine's 180,000 students. Now Maine state government is trying to fund it at 55% of this number, which was voted in quite a few years ago. The 2016 budget, the cost will be $2.2 billion. The subsidy 
is the amount the state pays toward the EPS defined cost of education. And in 2016, the state subsidy, $888 million. Local share of the cost of education minus the state share, which is $2.2 billion minus $888 million, the 2016 budget of local share is $1.1 billion. That means the mill rate of local districts that local districts must pay to reach local share of the cost of education in the 2016 budget, the mill rate is 8.48%. That is what the mill rate is to meet that so that the town, so your towns will get money from the state. Now the federal funds, the state receives about 213 million in federal dollars, mostly tagged at poor and low performing schools. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act, also known as No Child Left Behind, is law that governs the distribution of most of this money. We get also $50 million in nutritional aid from the USDA. <clears throat> so if we look at it, we've got $2.2 billion minus the state share of $964 million. So the local share, again, is $1.1 billion at a mill rate of 8.48% couple of little, little notes here. In 2005, the cost of educating each of Maine's 200,000 K through 12 students was $8,930 per student. In 2015, the cost of educating each of Maine's 180,000 students, in other words, we've jumped, we've lost 20,000 students over that five year period, or 10 year period the cost of educating those students is $11,720. So that's an increase of 31% in 10 years. Over those 10 years, the state contribution to those costs have risen 17% above the rate of inflation. And at the same time, the local share of those costs has risen, risen just one hundredth of 1%. And that is the uh, source of that was the Maine Education Policy Research Institution. Institute, rather, I'm sorry. Unsustainable costs. So in one de decade, Maine saw a 12% drop in the number of K through 12 students. In the same decade, the cost of education rose by 31%. So that's, that's where we're at. And what is needed if, if the state to match the 55% requirement that by law that we voted in years ago, to reach that 55%, the state's contribution needs to be $246 million. So that's where we're at on the education situation. Uh, I encourage you to, again, go to maine.gov to listen to any committees and <clears throat> watch what's going on in the legislature and stay on top of it and please feel free to give me a holler at any time uh, if you've got any questions or concerns. Again, I will be at the Lawrence Public Library on the first Saturday of the month at 9 o'clock for meeting with any constituents. Thank you. The Village Market, located at 95 Main Street, Fairfield, is your small town, fully stocked grocery store with that big store feel. Carrying quality vegetables, fruits, meats, deli items, and sure fine products. They even have some inviting desserts. On your lunch break, stop by and grab one of the prepared ready to go meals. Village Market's knowledgeable and courteous staff makes your visit an enjoyable experience. Visit them on Facebook and online at villagemarketfairfield.com. Open seven days a week, the Village Market. We've got your groceries and more. Holly and Doug's Country Diner, a friendly warm atmosphere where all food is homemade. Everything from eggs, including 17 omelets to homemade pancakes and homemade sausage, gravy, and biscuits. For lunch, there's sandwiches, wraps, meatloaf, chicken tenders, baked haddock, country fried steak or chicken, fried haddock on Fridays. We also have vegetarian meats, serving breakfast all day. Daily specials for breakfast and lunch. Open every day, 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Holly and Doug's Country Diner, Waterville Road, Norwich Walk. 
I started mainly elder care out of a love and passion for the elderly. Kathy is a wonderful person and she knows what she's doing. It's like a big family and, and your clients get to be family. No matter how you, like I say, no matter how you try not to, it, you just do. We will not only be your caregivers, but we will be your advocates. Please call us today and set up an appointment. Let us be there when you can't.